Let us pray. O oh, our God, we come before thee this evening and ask for thy grace. Draw near, O oh Lord, and bless our hearts. May all be to thy glory, we pray through Christ Jesus. Amen. Our reading this evening is in Acts chapter 20 and from verse 17 to the end of the chapter. Acts chapter 20 and starting at verse 17. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the light lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. But I have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so labouring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. And sorry most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Amen. May the Lord bless that reading of his holy word. If I can just give some announcements. Tuesday we have our fellowship and prayer meeting at 8 o'clock in the evening. Uh, Wednesday in the evening, 6 o'clock, Welsh Bible study with Cup of the Wrath, 7.30, Tabernacle Midweek Meeting, Bible study at 7.30 on Wednesday. Friday, uh, fellowship and prayer meeting at 8 o'clock in the evening. Saturday, 11 in the morning, Persian meeting where Pastor Puyan Messai will be speaking. All God willing, and we trust with God's blessing. Summer conference, if I can mention that briefly. Uh, normally held in Cardiff, but this year online. Uh, with speakers from America, uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland, England, Wales and Iran all represented Pray for God's blessing 
on this conference. The meetings will be on the days scheduled, at the time scheduled, uh, as shown on the leaflet uh, and on the website. Well, may God bless these meetings, all God willing, with God's blessing. Our hymn is 614. 614. Come, O thou, O victorious Lord, thy power to us make known. I'm not certain whether we know the tune, although it's not difficult to sing. The tune's name is Ortonville. Hymn 614. Come, O thou, O victorious Lord. For the Lord again in prayer. Our God and our Father, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We come again, O Lord, in that legal and right way of the Lord Jesus Christ, with the access bought by him through his blood. We thank you for the blood of Christ that takes away our sins. And we are sinners saved by grace, O Lord, and we come before a greater holy God. It is a remarkable thing in and of itself that sinners should become should, uh, the sinners should come before God. O oh Lord, we thank Thee and for the grace of this moment now, where we can turn to Thee and, Lord, our prayers rise and they are heard in heaven. O oh Lord, that Thou would indeed come down upon us and bless us together. We pray for the service here and in other churches this evening and indeed across the world. So we think of the cause of the gospel, both here and abroad. We pray for the prosperity of it. We think of the need of the gospel. 
Oh, the godlessness, oh, the sinfulness of man, and oh, the grace and the mercy of the gospel. Oh, that the gospel may come to these uh, peoples, the nations, and that they might, they might hear and, and, and they might respond. We know how hard the heart of man is, but we know also at times when the gospel suddenly gains entry. We pray indeed it might be a season like that for many nations. We pray we might play our part in spreading the gospel and those around us within our reach. We do what we can, O Lord, and knowing that we must do what we can and the Lord, thou will do what we cannot do. Oh, how we have to trust thee, O Lord, and rest in thee. Lord, we know that we cannot do anything without thee. Yet our duty we must do, but even that duty is powerless without thee. Without Christ we can do nothing. So, Lord, be with us in what we can do, but also especially be with us in what we cannot do. And that great gospel work of the heart, the blessings of the soul, all to the glory of God. Oh, Lord, we pray uh, for these great things, how we can be uh, shriveled up in our hearts and be so limited and can be so defensive uh, with our own weakness that we retreat back and uh, with the onslaught of the devil, uh, we keep ourselves to ourselves. Instead, O oh Lord, of being like the Apostle and the Apostle Paul and always going forward by the grace of God and the help of God. We think of Spurgeon who said when the devil attacked him most and he was most prone uh, to retreat back that he would go more forward. And we ask, Lord, that we might have the strength and the grace to do that. Help us, O Lord. Oh, make us strong in the Lord. Strengthen our souls, we ask. We ask for thy help in this, in all manners of way, with our circumstances, our human constitution, how we can be prone to anxieties. In all these things, O oh Lord, we pray for thy providences and thy help. And in whatever circumstance that we are placed, we may do uh, our faithful duty. And we might stand according to the grace of God and do what we can. And, O oh Lord, we know that it might seem all hopeless and weakness, and yet how strange it is. It is that weakness that is so blessed, so that thou might have all the glory. And so we pray this evening that thou might have the glory. Watch over us now, O oh Lord, as we speak and we hear. Keep us from error in our words and keep us from error in our hearing. Help us throughout this evening unto the end of this day, O oh Father, we pray through Christ, thy beloved Son. Amen. Well, let us turn this evening to Acts chapter 20 and verse 21 in particular, but the whole passage that we read and even the whole chapter, verse 21 testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as you read through these chapters in the books, in the book of Acts, you cannot but be impressed by the activity. It's not called the book of Acts for no reason at all. We see these men filled with the Holy Spirit, traveling long distances, preaching the gospel wherever they went and taking time to establish churches and, and their settled churches and to preach the word of God to them. They were all activity. They had an energy of God. It is such a setting which we see before us in this chapter 20. We see here the Apostle Paul traveling back from Greece, calling in at various places on his way to Jerusalem, where he would be arrested and imprisoned and this he knew as the Holy Spirit had testified to him. But we note this part of the journey here, particular part in chapter 20, where he sailed past Ephesus. And because he knew a journey 
uh, into Ephesus would detain him too long, uh, he sailed past Ephesus and rather uh, called the leaders of the church in Ephesus to visit him in Miletus, which was just a little south of Ephesus. And so we read here of a most moving meeting between the Apostle Paul and the leaders at Ephesus. How moving the embraces and the kisses and all the tears when they realized they would not see him again. Oh, such a lovely scene. A scene of a pastor and his people, uh, or even pastors and other pastors, at his very best. And uh, we see here what blessing can do uh, to our relationship. Well, it's a lovely thing to read of this affection. And what is said here, more to the point, at this meeting is most revealing and helpful as Paul summarizes his ministry to the Ephesians, uh, to the church there. It's a kind of mission statement where we learn the practices of the apostle and also the church as well. Uh, we see the extent of the parish, so to speak. We learn also of the substance of what was taught and preached. Uh, the whole counsel of God is mentioned. The gospel is mentioned. Repentance and faith are mentioned. Well, let's consider these two aspects then this evening. Reaching the world, preaching the gospel. And first of all, reaching the world. Not this simple statement in our text, verse 21, uh, where the apostle uh, speaks of preaching the gospel essentially to both Jews and Greeks. And the Jews were, of course, the people of God, whose father was Abraham. But why mention the Greeks? Why the Greeks? Well, it means more than those from Greece, for sure. It even means more than those who spoke Greek. Uh, as Greek was the dominant language during this period, the lingua franca, you could call it. No, the Greeks here represent the Gentiles. It's a term to represent the Gentiles, those who were not Jews, essentially the whole world. The whole world is in this term, the Greeks. And so we see here what Paul is saying. He preached the gospel to the Jews and the whole world, or as far as he could travel. And how he traveled indeed the jews and the whole world now this is not a one-off statement many mentions in the scriptures of jews and gentiles there is of course a sense that the gospel went first to the jews but it is evident it was always meant for the world very clear from the scriptures so we see in paul's ministry this is worked out uh, he often searched out Jews in the synagogue, even if in some Gentile country. And because, as we know from the accounts we have here in the book of Acts and from the epistles, uh, because of the hardness of the hearts of the Jews, he said he would go to the Gentiles. But even then we see with the apostle the broadness of vision. As mentioned here, he preached to both Jews and Gentiles. And we see that, don't we? time and time again. And it's something we should note. These are significant things, and things which bring important principles to us as a church. Is this not what we see with the Saviour too? He most certainly came first to the Jews. He also went to the half-Jews, the Samaritans. And then we read of the Greeks inquiring, Sir, we would see Jesus said the Greeks. And our Saviour, deeply troubled by this, why was he troubled? Because he knew he had come to save the world and he would die for these Greeks and die indeed for the nations of the world. As the Samaritan said, he was the Saviour of the world. What a wonderful statement that is, the broadness of it and the relevance of it to all the nations of the world. This is the Saviour of the world. Well, we know going on, the Jews uh, looked down on the Gentiles and the Gentiles were against the Jews. Uh, not only here, 
uh, in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, we see with the nations, in the New Testament, we see in the uh, Book of Acts and in all the other accounts in the Gospels and so on, and even in the history of the world, we see this clash between the Jews and the Gentiles. And then when it came to the church, when Jews were converted, this problem went on. Uh, they were initially against the gospel being offered to the Gentiles even. And then later on, when they had accepted that the Gentiles were truly saved, they still had issues with the Gentiles. But what I would say is this, what has that got to do with the gospel? These are the ways of a troubled world and the ways of the Lord are quite different. It's through the ways of the Lord we look. And as we apply this, we may think and compare ourselves with the Jews. We are not Jews, of course, but we can have an attitude, just like the Jews had at this time. Now, of course, they were God's special people, but if they truly understood that, it would have humbled them and given them a heart for people. And especially in this coming of Christ and the time to reach men with the gospel, they should have responded with a heart like the heart of God. But rather, uh, they were parochial. Uh, they only thought of themselves, their own people. They thought of them, thought themselves as a special nation, not in that spiritual sense, by grace which would humble them, but in a worldly and a proud sense. And they had a prejudice against other nations, which our Saviour often corrected with the disciples. And we see it in the accounts Sometimes this prejudice was manifested as having no interest. You know, I was just reading uh, the other day and uh, the account there when the disciples went into the villages of the Samaritans and they did not receive them. And uh, they responded asking the Saviour to send fire down upon the village. And our Saviour corrected them that their spirit was not of the Lord. And we must realize that probably they would not have said those things if it was a Jewish village. Most probably. But there you see the prejudice come out because it was a Samaritan village, I suggest. Just a suggestion. Well, very easily, and there was much in the news at the moment of racism, but very easily we can have a racist outlook. And it can be quite subtle too. Not just with color of skin, but with every difference with uh, linguistic uh, prejudice and peoples within nations and nation to nation and all of the kinds of divisions as well that we have this prejudice against each other and also we can see it in attitude towards immigrants and asylum seekers who are very much in need and are visitors to our countries and if such things are in our hearts, such prejudices and attitudes, not only is it not good, my friend, it's actually very bad. And it's not of the spirit of the Lord. It is the spirit of a troubled world, but not the spirit of a gracious gospel. How should we see then these nations, these peoples, these immigrants and asylum seekers as precious souls, as immortal souls, and our mission field. Just look at what we see here and even go to the back of your Bible and very often you have maps there, don't you? And look at the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul crossing borders as if they were not there, going here, there and everywhere. Read of the missionaries too and how they went out and what a good spirit they had as they identified with the people. Look up also the Great Commission. Go! Go to all the nations and teach them, preach to them. And all this fits in with the biblical view of what we see in the scriptures of the heart of God towards man, towards the whole world. This is the extent of our mission, whether to travel as missionaries, whether to pray for these nations, these peoples, or whether to receive the nations into our own country. My dear friend, we have a gospel for the whole world. This is our parish. This is our remit. This is what we should do. These are our instructions. 
we are to preach the gospel to the whole world. So that principle we see at the beginning. Take the gospel to all peoples. Have a heart like the heart of God to all nations, all people. See them as immortal souls. And then what do we preach to them? What do we say to them? What do we say to our own people? What do we say to these nations? We see here the words of the Apostle, they're very helpful words. He says in verse 27, if I can take you there first of all, declare unto you all the counsel of God, or the whole counsel of God as we call it. We'll come to that in a moment. And then in our text, verse 21, the gospel, the heart of the gospel, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. What a great statement. This is what he preached. He says that in another place, of course, as we know, to preach Christ crucified. Well, come back to this whole counsel of God or all the counsel of God. What is this whole counsel of God? Well, it cannot mean every verse in the whole Bible, even allowing for the fact that some of the scriptures were not yet written, it would not have been possible for Paul to preach every verse in the time he had in Ephesus. No, rather it means all the teachings, comprehensive Bible teaching, large matters and small matters. Just like a pastor might go through the scriptures and go through a series perhaps in a book of the Bible or epistle in the New Testament. And there he goes, verse by verse, or passage by passage. He doesn't skip over anything. He expounds all the words. He doesn't avoid what is difficult. He doesn't jump to his favorite themes. All this we know is good because so often there are hidden blessings in the things we hardly suspected would be a blessing. And there we see the whole counsel of God, the sufficiency of the scriptures come out and uh, how they have a a word to say for all aspects of life and they are sufficient and so in that sense all the counsel of God and um, the whole medicine cupboard you could say every medicine is there for us to take when suitable the two major things I might say about the whole counsel of God to explain it further one major thing is that this whole counsel of God is not a flat matter uh, the truths have a relationship to each other. They are, they are in harmony and the composition as well. Uh, just like you know, the notes of a piano. You just, you, we could play them all, all the notes, but uh, what is that? But as we see, uh, the pianist and the concert pianist and there the emphasis and how all these notes are used, uh, the expanse of it all, uh, all the keyboard is used and there we see uh, how it all comes together as a wonderful composition and this emphasis they're, they're not just played blandly there's a softness of touch and, and, and maybe sometimes hardness of touch and so uh, you find don't you uh, all these varieties in, in, in the playing of the piano which is a picture of the whole counsel of God it is a composition which leads me to the second major thing I want to mention about the whole counsel of God. Yes, it's not just a flat thing, as if you go verse by verse by verse with no different emphasis. No, rather it's a living thing. And it's much to do with the gospel and much to do with Christ. You understand all the counsel of God when you see the place of Christ in it and the place of the gospel in the whole counsel of God. Well, let me just say this. Sometimes I feel people use this phrase, or oh, we preach the whole counsel of God, as an excuse. An excuse not to regularly preach the gospel, and not to hold gospel services, perhaps, every Lord's Day. Ah, oh, yeah, we, we don't have a, a gospel service, we preach the whole counsel of God, and it sounds so impressive. But it's not impressive, because it is a misunderstanding of the whole counsel of God. Yes, the whole counsel of God is there, but with emphasis, in harmony and 
with the major themes coming out, the gospel and Christ. Indeed, you cannot really understand the whole counsel of God without a great emphasis on the gospel. The gospel is the theme of the whole counsel of God. And Christ too. Christ himself said, did he not? Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they, are, um, and they are they which testify of me. They testify of me. They search the scriptures. They testify of me, he says. Very similar and reminiscent the words spoken of Christ preaching to the two men on the road to Emmaus. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Christ is the key to the scriptures and the key to the Old Testament. And the whole counsel of God is all about Christ. As we sing in the hymn, Christ from whom all blessings flow. The whole counsel of God is dominated by Christ. God reveals himself to us through Christ. Through Christ we know God. And so the importance of these emphases of the scriptures, we bring them out and the centrality as we see the emphasis in the words of Paul. Yes, the whole counsel of God, but what did he preach? He said, I preach Christ crucified. And the blood of Christ, the gospel, is central, as we know, I'm sure. But, you know, it's worth just bringing these things out, isn't it? And so our mission is this. Listen to this mission. is to preach to the world the wonderful composition and harmony of the whole counsel of God, the sufficiency of Scripture, where the biblical emphasis of Jesus Christ and the gospel and Calvary and the blood of Christ, where men are saved from their sins, Christ the substitute, Christ the Lamb of God, those who believe in him, their sins are taken away and placed upon Christ. He saves those from their sins. He takes the judgment and they can know God. And he preaches that to Jews and Greeks and the whole world. What a mission, my friend. What a mission. The whole counsel of God, the gospel, the saving gospel, Christ crucified to the whole world, to Jews and Greeks, the whole world. Great, great message. Great, great world. At least great in his size and his vastness. Certainly big enough for us. I know the cosmos is much greater, but this world is big enough for us. It's quite a task to preach the gospel to the whole world, but this is the task God has given us. Go to the whole world and preach this great gospel to the whole world. Well, what a mission. But let's come to what I mentioned as the heart of the gospel. And the, and the Apostle Paul here mentioned the essence of the message that the theme he kept bringing through yes whole counsel of God but time and time again he would bring through Christ and the gospel and so he mentions here he testified to Jews and also to Greeks repentance toward God verse 21 and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ we see here Paul does not bother himself with philosophies plenty of that about at that time, nor with politics, plenty of politics about at that time. He was rather a true evangelical preacher. Here we see a true evangelical man who preached the gospel. And we note the order repentance toward God, faith toward Jesus Christ. There's an order there. First, we feel our need of Christ. We see ourselves as sinners firstly secondly we go to the savior of sinners very logical isn't it we feel our need we know we are sinners we go to the savior of sinners repentance toward god faith toward jesus christ but not those two things and the exact wording repentance toward god why toward god well the word toward in the first place uh, reflects something of the going away from God which is true otherwise and the endless separation between man and God. We see, don't we, in the world today 
real sense, they are all going away. Where are they going? They're all going away from God and endless separation. But this word toward reverses the trend and takes a man toward God. He was going away from God, now toward God. But why repentance toward God in particular? Well, we know God made all, made us all in his image. So when we sinned, we sinned against our maker and our creator. And Adam sinned, and we have sinned ever since. Our good God, and we sinned against him. That's why repentance is toward God. And also, the laws of God are there and belong to God. And they are good laws, the laws of love, we might call them. And so when we sin, we sin against his law and we offend God. And he made us and also uh, he established for us the way to know God with obedience. Of course, Adam fell, but then it was laid down in the Ten Commandments for us to understand. And now we understand through the law of God that we indeed have sinned against God and his law. As David said, against thee, the only, have I sinned. Yeah, we sin against ourselves and sin against other people. But in essence, we sin against God. That's why repentance is toward God. Because we sin against God alone when we sin in truth. And it's no small thing either. As we think of the infinite purity of God. And think of our scarlet and our crimson sins. And how we should blush. We think of scarlet and crimson to describe our sins. But also our faces. How we should blush at our sins. We think of the holiness and the perfection. The infinite purity of God. And the loveliness of God. And then our, our lives and our behaviour. Scarlet and crimson. As David said, my sin is ever before me. Everything we touch, what a mess our lives is. It's not just here and there, but the contagion is everywhere. Uh, whatever we do, whatever we think, there are the fingerprints of sin everywhere. And also we repent towards God because only God can forgive. As he is the one offended and he is God. Let's not forget that. He is God, Almighty God. Only God can forgive for this reason and all these reasons I've mentioned. We, we preach repentance toward God. To him you go, my friend. What shall I do with my repentance? Go to him, go to God. With sorrow, say sorry. With repentance, turn away from those things. Go to him. Confess your sins before him. But then there's something else here. Yes, repentance toward God, but then also faith towards Jesus Christ. Why faith toward Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the way back to God, essentially. And this repentance is part of it. Faith completes it. Repentance shows our need of Christ. Faith in Christ, of course, is what saves us. And they are two and one and the same. You can't really separate them. Repentance of sin, repentance towards God and faith towards Jesus Christ. But in particular, faith towards Christ is the way back to God. He's the pointed way. He's the Messiah of God. He's the legal way and the only way. Are you going to look at other ways? Are you going to devise your own way? Who are you, my friend? What kind of thinking do you have anyway to devise a way back to God? Or follow the thoughts of other sinful men? No, we have here the pure thinking of God, the gospel thinking of God. And Christ is that way. He is the only way. And what is more, not only is he the way back to God and the only way, he can save us, he can reconcile us, he can remove our sins, as we've said already, which offend him. Yes, the blood, as we mentioned, Calvary. There on the cross of Calvary, 
That's why it all comes to that climax, doesn't it? You think of the scriptures and you see all the chapters. This all builds up to Calvary and Christ and Christ crucified. And there Christ died for sinners and the blood was shed. The blood was his death and his suffering. The judgment of God on sin, on our sin. And all who believe in him. He is a substitute. He dies in our place. He is a sacrifice for sin, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, the atonement. And one more thing from our text here. This faith is toward Jesus Christ. We might note that in the same way as repentance is toward God. Here we see we must in our hearts reach out to him, go to God and go to Christ is what these words tell us. And so indeed it is forward moving. There is a move of the heart in the depths of the heart as we mentioned this morning. But once the depths are stirred, the heart is moved. Where does it go? It goes to Christ, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, therefore, come is the message. If I can speak to those who are not saved here this evening, or go, whichever way you want to look at it, whichever perspective you're looking from, either from Christ saying, come, or from the position you are, and go, go, or come. Go towards God. Go towards Jesus Christ is the essence of the meaning. Go to him, my friend. He's the Saviour. This is a great issue in your life. Your life can be very busy and filled with all comings and goings. Disappointments, encouragements, moments of sadness, moments of happiness. All these things come and go in the lives of people. But you know, there's something terribly missing. It is not this moment in your life. We believe in Jesus Christ. And then the great eternal matter is sorted. You know the living God. You know your maker and creator. This is the message we preach to this world. Nothing more wonderful and more urgent. Nothing more urgent and more wonderful. Whichever way you look at it, it is urgent. It's also wonderful to offer to men and women forgiveness of sins and life, eternal life in God through Jesus Christ. And this is our mission, to preach the gospel to the world. Let us not water down the gospel or diminish the gospel. Let us not diminish our parish and say it's only these people. Understand the fields before you. Go wherever the Spirit leads you. If they come to us, receive. And tell them the gospel, wherever we find ourselves, tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are souls, all of them are souls. They need Christ. And then do not diminish the gospel. Tell them of the grace of God towards sinful men and women. Tell them they can know the Lord through Jesus Christ, can know life in their souls, forgiveness of sins. It's the best of messages. Ah, yes, we'll come with persecutions and with trials in this world. But as our Saviour said, even with those persecutions, the blessings of the gospel are a hundredfold more than the blessings of this world. And we might add, are a thousandfold more with the inheritance of eternal life. And even that seeming exaggeration, hundredfold, thousandfold, actually is an understatement. Thousandfold doesn't quite capture it. The life, the glory of God. Well, we have a task, a wonderful task. And so much militates against us doing this. Our own spirits, our own depressions. Our own attitudes, our prejudice, attacks of the devil. So for these many reasons we can retreat and go into the bunker, so to speak. Instead of really understanding 
that the world needs to hear this message. And we must go to them whilst we can and tell them of the Saviour. Oh, we are very much in our weakness. And perhaps the task might be overwhelming to you and might make you think, oh, there's no point, I can't do it. Well, no, it's often in our weakness that the blessing comes anyway. And almost invariably, I would say, in our weakness. Do what you can, my friend. Just do what you can. Start with what you're able to do. Speak of the Lord. Share the gospel. Have a heart for people. It's a lovely way to live. And it reflects the great heart of God. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, help us, O Lord, to see this great example of the Apostle Paul, which only reflects what we saw in our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, which also we find in the very attributes of God as seen in the Scriptures and experienced in our heart as well. And indeed, O Lord, if the Gospel has come to my poor heart, then indeed it is a Gospel for other souls as well. Hear our prayers. Let all be to thy glory. Amen. Well, our closing hymn is 867, 867. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armour on, strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal Son. 867. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.